Zach Reynolds alongside Luke Hamilton, Oilers head coach Rob Murray, for this week's virtual coaches show. And, you know, right off the bat, we got to some games uh, this week. A, a busy slate, four games in five days. Um, you know, just the, the Sunday off, essentially, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Monday again with the makeup game. And, I mean, have you, have you ever seen a, a schedule like that before, um, whether it be playing or coaching, juniors, pro, um, you know, outside of youth hockey, have you ever seen four in five days? Yeah, about eight times this year. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, this, this, this is commonplace in the, this, this COVID year. So um, just a different, different scheduling as far as the days go. Like, you know, we don't necessarily play many Thursday night games and very, very rarely play on a Monday. So, um, yeah, it's, it's funny. I was actually was talking to Taylor Hall yesterday. And, and as you guys know, I, I don't tend to look too far forward into the, the schedule. And so we, we have obviously Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then Tony was asking, asking me because Kansas City was looking for ice on Sunday on the day off. And, and I kind of I was like, why do they need ice here on Sunday? Like, where are they going? Like, you know, I thought maybe they're staying overnight and going to Allen or something. And he goes, we play on Monday. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. I said, so um, no worries. I mean, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's in, you know, this time of the year, I, I think, uh, especially playing the same team, nobody has an advantage per se. You know, like the travel for us is, you know, exactly the same as them other than, you know, we'll come home after the game on Friday. And I'm sure they'll come up on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. So just a little bit of difference in, in when you're when you're 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 hitting the road. But uh, other than that, both teams in the same same boat, right? I mean, we we're, you're both playing four games in five nights. There's no excuses either way. And uh, entering into the weekend, just how's the conditioning been going with a guy like Roman Durney, uh, who you plan to, to really enter back into the lineup here? Uh, do you feel with his conditioning and getting ready to be in net again uh, that this could be a, a real advantage for you uh, with a goalie that's maybe fresh and ready to go um, for a slate that's four games in five days? And uh, we saw him uh, for about uh, six to eight minutes there um, at the end of that uh, last game this past weekend. Yeah, I think Roman's ready to go. He's going to start tomorrow night. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully he can, he can uh, carry the load a little bit through the weekend. Uh, Williams is not, uh, as of right now, is not available to us until Saturday um, at the earliest. So uh, we'll see where Willie is come Saturday. But Roman, um, I'm talking to him after practice today, and he just feels, uh, feels right now where, if anything, it's just his timing is a little bit off. And I, I think that's, that's something – quite honestly, I think it comes back real quick. Like, it's not, it's not like we're looking at weeks and days of it. I think, quite honestly, it should, shouldn't be much more than a, a good, good 10 minutes of the first game. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that he's going to be able to come back and, and, and step into where he was prior to his injury. And it's been a long, long road back for this kid. I mean, he's, he's worked, he's worked his tail off to get to where he is. And, and uh, we weren't sure whether, He'd, he'd have a chance to even, you know, see the net again this year. So, you know, there were, there were times where it was contemplated just set, uh, shutting him down for the year. So, you know, he's battled back and, and um, you know, we need, we need some strong goaltending. I mean, you know, truth be told, it's, you know, I, I think Hayden's played uh, well for us, yet um, on a certain nights, it, it, you know, it, he, he hasn't. And, and so we need somebody to be, be – uh, step in there and be a little bit more consistent. You know, we haven't seen Roman in a full game in a while. I mean, March 19th was the last time we, we saw him play uh, anything in Allen. And then, you know, he was added to the injured reserve uh, on the 20th. Um, and something maybe fans you maybe don't remember, you know, a big, big uh, puck player, really likes to go behind the net, likes to, to play the puck. And, and with that, you know, what, what are the advantages of having a goaltender that not only likes to play the puck, um, but, I mean, we, we've seen it, you know, he enjoys it, but he's really good at it as well. It gives it, it really helps the defenseman. I mean, you know, there's a there's a comfort level there with with a goaltender that can play the puck and and that basically you know he's going to come out. And there there's there's times when a, a, a goalie that is not necessarily as aggressive with the puck play as as Roman is, it's hard to read when and 
when a guy's going to come out. Like, you know, you, you'd be going back thinking the goalie's coming out, yet he's not. Now, Roman's more consistent that way. Like, he, he likes to come out and play the puck. He, he, he plays it very well. Um, my couple conversations with him this year is the fact that I just want him to get, him, get too overconfident with the puck because that's when a goalie gets in trouble. And, you know, you, you look at some guys that, through the years where regardless of how good your you, uh, puck handler you are as a goaltender, you always end up getting yourself in trouble. And that, that being a turnover in the wrong place, just turning the puck over and, you know, an easy goal for the other team. So um, that's something I think he, he, he did convey to me today that he, he doesn't feel is, is there yet, is his is timing with, with playing pucks. But for me, it's a big advantage to the, to the, to the defenseman, especially going back for pucks. If you know, the goalie's coming out and you can kind of have that mindset that, you know, he is always looking to do that. And um, he's, he's definitely that guy. Now, you know, we guard against it in our building because we get so many funny bounces that, uh, you know, I don't care what kind of, uh, how good you are as a puck handler, that puck hits the, the seam on the boards and it bounces back in front of the net and you're standing behind the net and we're hooped. So, you know, we, we always tell our goaltenders that uh, if, if, if you don't feel comfortable coming out to play pucks, especially down the Zamboni door, uh, when we're, you know, first and third period, I, I would prefer them just stay in the net. And then now, now getting back to what I said, now the D-man know he's not coming out to play it. So, so you know, you've got that, that set in your head as far as a, a game plan goes. You know, something lastly, just on Roman Derny, something we're able to even notice, you know, all the way up in the broadcast booth, not being able to be around these guys on a day-to-day basis. It's just Derny's a guy that's got a smile on his face a lot. He interacts with the fans um, quite a bit when he's in the crease, and he just loves playing the game. You can tell that, uh, you know, from all the way up in the broadcast booth. And, and can you just speak a little bit on what type of guy you've got in the locker room with Roman Derny? He's been there all along, but just uh, the type of guy that guys love to play for uh, in front of his crease. He's just been uh, – uh, really a great sport this whole time uh, from what we've noticed about just getting prepared and ready to get back in that net. Well, Derns, Derns is a great story. And, and, you know, he is, he's such a great kid. Like, I mean, from day one, I, I you know, my, uh, you know, Zachary was here, my son at the time. And, and, you know, he really kind of bonded with Roman and, and it was, it was neat, you know, like, I mean, he was, and he's, he's a very personal uh, guy like, you know, not just a hockey player, but just a person in general. And the guys really, you know, kind of love that about him. And, and I do too. And he, he's a great teammate. He cares. And, you know, he wants to win. Like, and, and, you know, that's the bottom line. But, yeah, he's got that, that soft side to him. And, and he's, he's very uh, interactive with, with the fans, like you said, and, and, and with me and, and with, it, with his teammates. Um, you know, you guys probably, if you ever get a chance, maybe just to take him and, and have an interview with him. Like he, he, he came from a little bit of an impoverished upbringing and it was a hard road for him to get to where he is. Like he was not a silver spoon type kid. And so whatever he's accomplished in his career to get to this point, it was flat out hard work and a lot of sacrifices. And so you know, that goes back to him growing up in Slovakia. But, you know, like I said, it, he'd tell the story better than I, I would. I, I only know bits and pieces of it. But, you know, he had a hard, hard life as a kid and, and uh, you know, made it to where he is now. Speaking of, you know, affiliated players, the AHL as a whole decided not to, to go for the playoff this season. But there will be, a, you know, a tournament style play um, for the Pacific Division. Oh. And, you know, we've seen with Bryce Kindop up there this season, um, he's got 20 points essentially in 40 games, you know, 10 goals in that time period. And he obviously was really coming on at the end of his time here in Tulsa with his 14 games that he played uh, right before he went on the COVID protocol. And with that, did you see, you know, that kind of production, you know, being there for him once he uh, moved up to the AHL level? I mean, a lot of the times he's, he's getting even, you know, first, second line minutes it seems each night up there. Uh, and, and with that, do you think the 14 games that he played here at the beginning of the season, you know, with him never playing pro before and coming out of a shortened WHL season, uh, do you think that that really helped him, uh, you know, jump into that, that quick kind of flying uh, style he ended up playing up there? Extremely beneficial. I mean, there, there's no two ways to look at it. Like, I mean, that gave him the opportunity with the American League delayed 
um, to get playing. And, and you're right, like to get a taste of pro hockey in general, it wasn't just, it's not the ECHL American League, you know, it's, it's just playing pro. And he had some development to, to do while he was here within those 14 games. And I, I saw a great improvement in him. And it, to me, it, it, it made it a lot easier for him to step into the American League and, and get going right away. Now, you know, and he would have probably had those road, road bumps or speed bumps along his way if they had started on time at the American League level. I, I, don't, I don't think he would have had any issue getting to where he is at this point, but he did have an advantage at, at having, having played here and getting that taste of the, the game. And, and, you know, quite honestly, expectations. Like players that come out of junior or college I don't know that they, they know the expectations of the pro game and uh, just the way it's just everything guys, like living on your own, like, you know, like finding a way to figure that out. You know, you don't have a billet mom making you dinner every night. You don't have, you know, you don't have anybody like you're basically junior college. You're there to play hockey, you know, here you're, you're a man, you're, you're living life and, and, and it's outside the rink. Like you got to take care of yourself. And that's a lot of, you know, sometimes sometimes guys adjust to that very well. Um, other times, it takes a while. Like it, it, it's it's amazing some of the stories you hear where guys are just so inept at life. You know, just because the, everything's been taken care of them uh, for them uh, throughout all all their careers to that point. So he had a chance to kind of get a taste of that here, and and I, I knew like I knew both Jack and himself, and even uh, Maxi would 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 uh, have have a good you know, have success up there. Um, Golad's, I mean, he hasn't played that much lately, uh, but Bedini's in the lineup every night. So is uh, 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 Ken Dopp. So these guys, I think they really benefited from being here at the beginning of the season. And speaking of rookies, there's plenty, you know, in this league and on this team as well, and guys that just have stuck through, uh, you know, at the ECHL level this year in that locker room for the Oilers, uh, is there anybody in particular, you know, with the, you know, those new situations of becoming a man, like you mentioned, being a rookie in the league and adjusting to the professional level of hockey. Uh, have you seen anybody that's really stuck out to you that's become a leader in that locker room, even as a rookie? Um, you, you know, you listen to an interview from a guy like Greg Burmaster just on ECHL week a couple of weeks ago, a guy that's really engaged and knows the meaningful hockey that's been played here as of late. Uh, you know, barring really uh, points per game, Charlie Samper would probably be ahead of him in points on this team. Given more games, he's right up there with the top four of scores this season. And, and is there anybody that in that locker room, something that we can't see, that's really been a leader in this, uh, in that role as a rookie? Um, yes and no. I, I, I'd say, Luke, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I think that, uh, you know, Bermie is a very intelligent kid, uh, well-spoken. Um, but quiet around the rink, uh, around the rink. Um, you know, we really don't have too many rookies when it's, when it's all said and done. I mean, you got Marlowe and Landrigan and uh, a couple guys. Really? I mean, that's, that's about it. And then Derny, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, I think, I think out of all of them, I mean, we can get back to Roman Derny. I mean, again, Burmaster is, like I said, he gives you everything he's got every night. Uh, very intelligent kid, but tends to be on the quiet side. He, he doesn't really, he's not a guy that steps up and, and is a raw, raw guy, but Roman is. And, and, you know, and he's, he's kind of, there's, there's a tendency for a first year guy to sit back and say, and stay, you know, kind of interior, interiorly say, well, I'm a rookie. I should, you know, it's not my place to be that guy, but you know, as the, as the seasons go by, you see their leadership kind of come through. Um, Roman's a guy that's kind of just said, you know, hell with it. I'm 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 that guy, and and I'm a leader. And and he's he's very talkative, especially for a goalie. I mean, goalies goalies are different. I mean, you know, you, you can't you got to call a spade a spade. I mean, these guys like they're, they're there's there's they're wired different, and a lot of them especially when they're playing, they don't want to talk. They don't want to be talked to, you know, and, and it's, and it like, whereas like a coach has to really walk a fine line with a goalie, because as much as you want to say something to him, let's say on a TV timeout or, or whatever, where 
I would interact with the players all like shift by shift by shift. A goaltender, I tend to just leave alone because you don't know what might trigger this kid, right? Like you just, you don't want, but Roman's the guy that he's, he's the opposite. Like he's, he's in between periods. He's talking like, you know, I had, you know, loved him to death, Gerald Coleman in, in, in Alaska. And his thing was he put a towel on his head, like in between periods and just stare at the floor. And so, you know, it was kind of like his way to say, nobody talked to me. I mean, you know, like that's not my thing. And, and, and hockey players tend to be so superstitious with things and goaltenders as a whole are that way where their superstition is a lot of times is I, you know, I'm playing tonight, nobody talked to me. And, um, and so, but Roman is, is, is different that way. He's, he's more interactive and, and loves to, he's, he's different. <laughs> with, you know, we were talking about the AHL. In a good way. <laughs> with the AHL, you know, starting later this season, it allowed some guys to, to, to begin here in the ECHL, you know, for us, it was about 15 games for, for a lot of those guys before San Diego got rolling. And when you look at that in the large picture of things uh, as a league, you know, do you think that it could be a, a, you know, complete hypothetical, but a beneficial thing if the ECHL say started uh, two weeks earlier in, in a year and uh, you know, you have those two weeks, maybe three weeks where guys can go there before the AHL, you end up with, I guess, more NHL alumni potentially because you'll see guys like a, like a Bryce Kindop or another really solid player that produces and plays every single night in the AHL come down to, to start his pro career there. And then obviously uh, maybe some, some benefit, to, as you had mentioned, for guys to kind of get adjusted to the uh, adult life before the AHL grind begins. Well, I think hypothetically, like as you said, it, yes. I mean, that, I think that's, that would be something that would be beneficial for sure. And uh, as it turns out, usually we start, what, a week earlier than mm -hmm. than the American League, and um, so you don't see those guys because of that. And and you're right, like, and those guys tend to be the healthy scratches for the first <clears throat> two, three weeks, maybe a month of the season, and then they they finally get their chance to play. And you know, around Christmas time, all of a sudden they're they're mainstays. Yet that would be a big help for them to to just get going. You're right, and uh, that would then. And on, on the flip side of it, that would deplete our lineup, though. You know what I mean? Like, when you look at it that way, and we're talking hypotheticals, um, we would start and have, I don't know, a handful, four or five guys, and then two weeks later, they're gone. So, so maybe it's not beneficial for us as a team, uh, beneficial for the player, I, I would say for sure. You go beneficial for the player, of course, is the development at any level that they're at. And uh, you kind of just look at uh, the ECHL in, in comparison to the, the style of play for some teams. You've been around this Western Conference in particular for plenty of time here now. And uh, is there really any uh, calling card, you could say, of the Western Conference, uh, just in general in your years here, uh, in particular this year, where it's really just a mountain division, a calling card of, of play style, uh, that can really help a player develop a certain part of his game, whether that be we really see a lot of the top goaltenders in this league be uh, out of the Western Conference, as well as a lot of the physical play really being delivered uh, by some of these top D, uh, D pairs. Do you think there's anything about the Western Conference in particular uh, that really sticks out? Well, we don't see the East enough, I guess, to make a real good comparison. I mean, we see the Midwest guys like, you know, Kalamazoo, Fort Wayne, Indy. Um, we don't see the the Mains and the Reddings and the, the Florida teams. You know, Orlando's coming in next year. But to, to answer your question, it is it is well known, and I, I know for a fact that the Western Conference is heavier. And and it's a much more physical game. Like Garrett Sassir made comment to Zach the other day where he said he cannot believe how much harder it is to play in the Western Conference. Um, you know, there's a guy that's played in Reading for a couple of years. So uh, how it all shapes out and how that's become that way, I don't know. Um, the NHL is the same way. You know, like they, they, they always say that, you know, you see the trade deadline where Western teams <clears throat> are always trying to load up or on, on heavier player, players or vice versa, where the Eastern Conference knows, let's say you're a team that 
you feel you've got a chance to make it the Stanley Cup final, and, the, and your road to the Stanley Cup is against a St. Louis or a, a, you know a team that that plays a, a much more physical game. That you need to be prepared for that, and they they tend to find a guy or two at the trade deadline to try to bolster their lineup just for that. And, you know, it's, it's nuances that are maybe hard to kind of pick out from game to game, but when you're in the grind and you're, you know, especially when we're playing the same teams night after night, it's, it's very, very noticeable. I mean, it's a physical brand of hockey in the West and, and it, it, it's just always been that way. When I was in Alaska, it was the same way. I mean, it, it was always considered that. And again, I didn't, I had never, when I went to Alaska, I'd never even seen an ECHL hockey game. And, you know, my first ECHL game I saw was the one I coached. And um, so I didn't know the difference. And then again, we never played anybody from the East when I was in Alaska. So, you know, my, my take on it is that it's definitely there. Yet I can't draw a, a true comparison only because I haven't had the experience of seeing these Eastern teams enough, you know? Would you say that that, I know some people say it, that that kind of uh, translates or maybe can be compared to in the Canadian Hockey League, you know, the WHL, especially in years past, maybe a little bit less nowadays, kind of considered the, the heaviest uh, of the three leagues and then the OHL, you know, producing more NHL picks than the other two leagues. Um, you know, do you think that that's still kind of a, a fair comparison uh, these days that each, you know, one of the major junior leagues kind of seems to have its own uh, calling card of its own? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, and I mean, I got it. And I last time I played junior hockey was 1987, maybe. So, like, uh, it's been a while for me. But back then, the Western League was – you know, it, it was a, a tiered system, basically. The West was the heaviest, the OHL next, then the Q, the Quebec League. And and that has, I think, for the most part, has stayed the same. Hockey in general isn't nearly as rough and tumble as it used to be. But I would say that that is how everything is considered in the Canadian uh, major junior uh, leagues, for sure. You know, you get the, the Quebec League is more of a skill set and – you know, fancy plays and the high scoring games. OHL's kind of gone that, you know, a little bit more that way. But I think the Western League is still, uh, you know, you've got your scores, you've got guys that can really play, but there, there's still that element of, of toughness and, and heaviness to the game. And it's, it's, it's always been like that. Um, I'm not sure why, like, like how that all kind of came about, but, it, but that's definitely, that's, that is, it's a word on the street. <laughs> you sort of look at that just across all the leagues, really in, in any sport at the development level, everything nowadays just with the access that we can get uh, is just kind of data driven. Uh, and, and there's always kind of a give and take with that. Uh, you know, you have the classic eye test and you have data. Uh, and, you know, maybe as broadcasters, we don't get the access that, uh, you know, maybe the NHL players sort of produce as far as saber metrics, you know, micro data, everything like that. But I just look at something maybe uh, more simple, uh, just like penalty minutes per game for like a player uh, developing at this level and uh, maybe situations that you put players like that in maybe in an early portion of a man's career he's learning how to stay disciplined because he's maybe catching up to the pace of the pro level you see a guy like Garrett this year uh, Justin Hamannick as defenseman Garrett this year's got two penalty minutes in the 18 games he's had this season uh, and you look at Justin Hamannick 62 games and only 10 penalty minutes so those guys uh, guys you look at maybe based on that statistic alone um, that you make decisions to put them in certain situations, such as late in a game. Uh, maybe it's a one goal game. You cannot afford a power play opportunity for the other team. You look at a team like Kansas city coming up, uh, who's just been really good at the power play this year. Are those things that uh, maybe make an impact on, on ice time in certain times in the game, whether it be the end of period or end of a game? It will be now. <laughs> um, not really. I mean, I mean, if, if, if we went by those standards, Mike McKee would only play like the first 10 minutes of the first period. So um, just, I'm joking, but <laughs> there's something that there's something to be said about that, Luke. I mean, Justin Hamnick, as you said, 10 minutes and, and he, I don't think he had a penalty until maybe the 45. Yeah, game I think game. 43rd game of the year. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I was, I was close. So um, he's, it's just, 
his style of play, I mean, he plays, plays a physical game, yet he plays it clean. You know, he doesn't – he's not high-hitting guys. He's not hooking and holding. I mean, uh, you know, another guy that, that tended to – and he's gotten better, but uh, J.C. Broussard, like, it was almost every night he was taking a holding or a hooking penalty. And <clears throat> it's just a difference of uh, mentality. Like, you know, those guys are, are I guess, in their head, are like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to put myself in that position. And uh, Harmonic's probably a better example than Sasir, only because Harmonic is six five or whatever he is, and, and he's a big man. And and it, it it could be very easy for him to take a penalty almost every night just by playing hard. But he doesn't. He finds a way to play within the rules, yet is effective the way he does. It. And um, you know, getting back to your very first comments about you know penalty minutes and and you know where you're at and getting back to playing heavy my whole career starting in junior I mean the the benchmark was 100 minutes a year, a year. like it, you know if you really wanted to have your stats look w good I mean whether it be 20 points in 100 minutes you know it, it was always that 100 minute mark that you wanted to hit and um the little story I, I was at I was at 98, I, I believe, in my year in St. John, New Brunswick. And I, I remember talking – and we were, it was the last game of the season and, and we weren't making the playoffs. And I, I remember talking to the ref. I said, at some point, you got to give me a penalty tonight because I need my 100 minutes. Well, I took a clapper off my face in the first period and, and broke my cheekbone, so I never, never got my 100 minutes. So I should have – I actually – now I look back on it, I should have told the ref off while I was leaving the ice so I would have got a, a bench minor. But um, – I always thought that 100 minutes was was attainable. It's not necessarily anymore. Um, you know, it, it's it's a rarity actually to see more than maybe one guy on each team with more than 100 minutes. But that was a that was a, a mainstay when I played, and and especially in junior, like it, you know, even the guys that weren't necessarily guys that would drop the, the gloves would find a way to, you know, throw in a couple of fights a year and and get their penalty minutes up. But anyways. Um, that, as I said, is not necessarily the benchmark anymore, yet anything around there, you know, you know you're competing. And, and it's, it's, it's not about going out and taking penalties. It's just knowing that, you know, you're, you're, you're competing every night. And as we, we know, like, I mean, just looking at our stats, like Mikey's got 128 minutes and nobody else is close to 100 almost. And, uh, well, Cromer's at 89. So, you know, you're – you know, there's that fits their mold, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's you, you you wouldn't be surprised. And and but even a guy like Mike McKee, for me, that is the way he plays. 120 28 minutes is kind of light, quite honestly. You know, but but that we know what he brings. But that's that's the kind of thing that where stats, analytics, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, kind of plays into what you're looking at. Uh, through the years. And do you think with less penalty minutes, you know, being administered these days, do you think that the, the number of I mean, power plays is down or do you just think there's less, you know, offsetting penalties, whether it be fighting majors, you know, fit, you know, roughing for a, after a whistle, you know, obviously saw a lot more of that until recently, you know, the turn of, turn of the century. And, and especially after, the, you know, the 05, 06 uh, coming on from there after the lockout and beyond, uh, do you think there are less power plays kind of given out now, or do you think it's just less penalty minutes of the kind of offsetting variety? Well, everybody's adjusted, Zach. And, and the reason being is that, like, when, as you mentioned, coming out of the lockout, they put in all the obstruction rules, and it was, it, it was very, very hard to adjust your game to, to doing that. I mean, I was so, I was so programmed to put a, a, a hook on a guy or, and I could do it. I mean, you're allowed to do it prior to the lockout. And so it was hard to adjust for the players. Now, today's player has grown up with that. So they don't know the difference. You know, like they, they don't know the hooking and holding how it used to be. I mean, you go back and watch some games in the late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, it, it's kind of disgusting how much it, it happened, you know, and, and but – for that reason, I was actually having a conversation yesterday, Taylor Hall and I, and uh, we were talking about that. And I think that, so the mentality of that is because these guys have not grown up with it and they, they haven't 
learn how to play the way that I played. Um, for that reason, there like coming out of a corner was almost impossible when I played. I mean, you, I mean, you just got mauled. I mean, it was, it was tough. And, but now because of the hooking and holding that is not allowed, well, not allowed on, you know, depending on what night and what ref you have, I guess, but, but you should take advantage of that because the, the challenge to the guy that's defending you is a lot harder now. Like, you know, we were talking about cycling the puck and how guys, uh, there's a mentality that you, that you just cycle, cycle, cycle. Well, there's got to be a point where you take the puck to the net and challenge the guy that's defending you. And because of the new rules, it really should be easier, not for these guys, but easier compared to what it used to be like. And so, you know, there, there's, there, there's got to, you could, I guess as a coach, you got to put that mindset in the guys that, hey, this guy cannot hold you up as you drive out of the corner. So you might as well try to. And, um, you know, it, it, but it's hard to kind of, like I said, today's hockey player, it's, it, the mentality is cycle, 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 throw the puck in the corner, you know, and well, there's just not many goals scored from the corner and, and you, you got to find a way to get in interior into the, 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 the shooting areas. Can you speak a little bit uh, kind of about that era, of course, uh, somebody to do it better than anybody in the corner, of course, is a guy like Wayne Gretzky, but you just uh, sort of look at his game it's hard to compare anybody to his game uh, just in general, but the importance of edge work and, and kind of the importance of just versatility and your skating ability. And, uh, you know, is that, uh, is that something that, that a pro athlete, especially at the ECHL level, has got to realize quick in his game, uh, you know, that that can get you to the next level, just having an ability to skate in every scenario of a hockey game. You see some guys that are just really north and south in their ability to get up the ice on the back check. Uh, I think that's something that I've just personally noticed really separates a lot of guys from making it to the NHL and, and not. And is that something that you sort of let guys know immediately if you maybe see something that can be developed? Well, you can, you can use a comparison to what I was just talking about, about, you know, challenging defenders. Um, you know, Charlie does it the best uh, out of anybody. Now, Charlie can skate better than anybody. And so when you talk about using your edges and you talk about Wayne Gretzky, I mean, it's about elusiveness. Like you have to, especially a guy that's undersized like Gretzky was, you have to be elusive. And, um, you know, you weren't around with uh, Steve Perfetto here, um, but Perf was, I mean, he was, he was the, the hallmark for that, really. I mean, a, a small guy, he was built well, but I mean, you know, you're going up against big defense when you're, you're just not escaping. And, but he had that elusiveness like where, he knew enough not to get pinned up on the wall and, and grind it out. Like he was, you know, he always juking and, and, and losing the defenseman. He was so good at it. And Charlie, Charlie, for the most part is just, he just turns on the wheels and, and rolls out of the corner. And I wish, you know, I guess to my point of the, the last, uh, what I, I talked about before, um, I wish more guys would, would realize that, that regardless of, I guess regardless of your, even your skating ability, you get a step on a guy, you got to go. And, and um, Charlie does a great job of that. And as I said, Steve Perfetto was as good as anybody doing it. And Alex Dosti too, when he was here, same thing, you know, smaller guys that, that just remained elusive. And Conlon Keenan's actually been doing that very, very well lately. And, and, and I had that discussion with him earlier in the season. I mean, he wasn't having any success because he was just, accepting of getting pinned up in the corner and I said you you've got to be moving prior to that guy arriving and and he's been a lot better uh, as of late as far as uh, his elusiveness goes final question to to wrap things up we haven't seen the Kansas City Mavericks since the first first week of April um so uh, been a while so for you know fans and you know even us what's something uh, maybe to, to keep an eye on with them that either they do well, you know, any particular uh, players that, you know, kind of stuck out, uh, you know, in the time that we've seen them this season, as I mentioned, about, about a month and a half since we've last seen them, which is probably the longest stretch of this. Well, it is the longest stretch of the season and probably been the longest stretch that we haven't seen them in more than a season. So, yeah. Um, well, I, I, you know, honestly, you know, you touched on it a bit earlier. I mean, their power play is still, very very effective and and uh something that we have to try to guard against as far as taking penalties um to start and and do a better job killing penalties um 
you know, they're not, they're not, uh, uh, you know, getting back to our talking about heaviness and stuff like out of the teams that we play, um, you know, like Angeles had good success against us. He plays a, a heavier game. Ouellette has run a mock on, on us. He's not a scorer, and he, he's maybe he's got one goal all year against us, and maybe one goal all year as far as I, I know. But um, he has taken out multiple guys on our team throughout the season. He hits like a train, and and we got you know that's a guy that. You got to have heads up when he's, when he's on the ice and he hits late, you know, like we'll, we'll move the puck and he tends to take a stride or two to finish that hit. Um, that might be a little late, but you know, you gotta, you gotta protect yourself. So, um, you know, they've got, uh, uh, a couple guys back down from Stockton, uh, their goaltending has been, you know, solid for them. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's a series here that obviously, I mean, it, we got eight games left, and and truth be told, I mean we got to we got to win all eight, and <clears throat> at the minimum seven, just to give ourselves a chance. So um, that's the task that we're we got in uh, in front of us, and and uh, you know we got to go to work. Well, uh, thank you as always for for taking the time to do this, and we'll catch up with you uh, tomorrow for the first of uh, four games coming up. All right, thanks, guys.